Hey guys, Woman02, currently getting ready to do a series of replays on some of the playtesting I've done with the new um, unbanned list. And some of the big winners, I think, for this format r really are going to be uh, your, your control style decks. So the deck we're playing here is actually a, a Bug or Sultai Loam Control deck. So you see an interesting inclusion of a card, um, Exploration, um, dig, to, dig Through Time, obviously, a, a uh, a new one as well. Uh, well, a new one that is now allowed. Exploration was before. Um, the reason we have Exploration in our deck is because when you're using Life from the Loam, which is um, kind of the, the powerhouse, the engine of this control deck, um, you're obviously able to get vast advantage. If you're pulling three lands back and can play two a turn, recast Loam, etc., um, you get a lot of advantage for, with it. Um, so, this hand is definitely a keep. Our initial going in game plan is that we're going to land a turn one Explorer and a turn one Deathrite Shaman. Um, and then, you know, look to Fuel Delve uh, for Dig Through Time, and we have a Stifle for a Fetch Land and a Daze that will probably burn off on almost any turn one play, because we want to fuel, again, the Delve for Dig Through Time, so we can actually get into gas, because so the hand really doesn't do anything on its own, it's just a Death Rite Shaman, which you'll actually find in this game becomes kind of a problem, because he is on a more aggressive deck than we are, uh, by, by far. Here we just go for the Trop. Play out the death right and pass it over. Opponent is playing a Merfolk um, aggro control deck. He plays Curse Catcher or tries to play Curse Catcher. We just daze it. Um, I don't think it's the best daze target in the world, but the problem with Curse Catcher is, you know, it, it's going to mitigate the power of daze because I ideally want to use daze when I don't have to pay any mana for it. And I don't want to be tapped out then, so I just go for it to fuel the delve. Draw land for the turn. Um, not, a, not a bad deal. Um, obviously, the downside of days is mitigated. Now, you note that I actually exile his creature um, to remove any possibility he could have like a delve uh, draw engine, like a Dig Through Time or Treasure Cruise. And also because I want to leave uh, my cards in my graveyard for Dig Through Time, so I don't really care about the damage right now. Leave up Stifle. He plays Docker Mystic. Uh, we draw Liliana for the turn. Uh, this is a good enough card that I decide to go off my Dig Through Time plan. Plus, Liliana fuels Delve regardless, and, you know, while there's a very stifleable target in Myriad Landscape, if his mana base is constrained, um, I don't per se need to keep that. Um, if I had to keep one of these two cards, it'd be Stifle, or Depression Dig Through Time. But what I'm looking to do now is, um, is just ditch cards out of my hand and his hand, and just kind of reduce his resources. I also figure with this Thada Adele, Thada Adele actually has gone up in my estimate quite a bit. Um, so this deck is running um, several swords in it. Um, it's got the Sword of Fire and Ice, and it has Sword of Light and Shadow, which the card that goes up in my estimate is a main deckable card. Typically speaking, you're going to see, in the in the older format, you would have seen Sword of Feast and Famine, which is a very strong card and probably better for its combat uh, abilities uh, than Light and Shadow is. But because we're using the Loam Engine in this deck, and we intend on fueling our graveyard with a lot of cards pretty quickly... Um, the Sword of Light and Shadow actually allows us to recurse a lot of our ETB creatures, which is, this deck is really, it's a, it's kind of a mix between a mid-range control deck, but it has kind of the crushing power over time of a, of a control deck. Um, where it tends to run into issues is in, like, the early game, you know, just staying alive so it can get its engine going and, and kind of win off of it. So at this point, he has thought of Adele, which is actually a card that I think he's played in this deck historically regardless. But actually goes up quite a bit in my estimate because now you you have Stoneforge Mystic legal in the format, so you're going to see a lot more Batter Skulls in decks. You're going to see Swords still, um, and you're going to see uh, Crucible of Worlds, which is another powerful one that you get. And actually with Myriad Landscape, Crucible of Worlds is essentially like sort of a life from the loam. Not quite the same, but but close. A um, lot slower, obviously. But here, he's obliged to probably attack our Liliana of the Veil. Um, I didn't want him to leave the Docker Mystic in place. It's just a card advantage engine for him. Sure, it works both ways, but he al he's allowed to select. Um, and actually, maybe it was fine for us, but either way you look at it, um, at this point, like we would have had to set or ha had to uh, use the Liliana because uh, Thought of Adele has Island Walk. Um, so I'm glad that we just used it initially. Um, like I said, though, he's obliged to attack the, the Liliana at this point, which he does um, because you want to get rid of it. He uses a Git Probe, sees the Stifle in our hand, sees the Dig Through Time, um, attacks the Liliana. So, this play is kind of a tell. When he goes, when he goes with this card, when he goes with this card, Lord of Atlantis, 
and he's on two cards in hand, I'm pretty sure he does not have available counter magic. Um, that said, he has dumped an island into his graveyard. Um, he probably he probably wanted to dig through time before attacks there. Just, just my thinking on it. Um, just so he he could know he could know what he was going to draw, and if he wanted to even attack Liliana, he probably did. But um, just to know, so. At this point, I go for the dig through time using the island that he's ditched into his graveyard, um, and the fact that I have uh, enough cards um, in my graveyard now with Liliana dead to exile all of them, uh, plus make a mana with death right from the island he discarded uh, to dig through time. When this resolves, which I'm kind of shocked it does, I, I, I'm obliged to go for it here because if I don't, I'm just going to get beat to death, and he's going to get to use the uh, Thought of Adele, which is a big problem for me. Um, I end up finding this. So... This was an interesting... All right, so what you saw was a couple lands, um, some powerful cards, but what I ended up going for... And I'm sorry, I had a tough time pausing there. Is a Collective Brutality and a Caracas. I figure Collective Brutality is probably good because it's going to allow me to know if I'm in the clear inside of his hand. Um, and I'll likely escalate it here because the Swamp is not really doing me any favors. Um, and Caracas will be able to continually flip the Thada so that I don't, um, I don't get into trouble with my own Crucible of Worlds or one of my swords which could, could very easily beat me. Actually, sort of uh, Fire and Ice uh, would beat me probably on the spot. Um, so you just go up so much on cards, and you just kill the Death Right Shaman. Um, so it appears that the replay is broken. Uh, I'm going to go on a quick pause, guys, and kind of get back to this. All right, guys, we're back, and hopefully this is going to work at this point. So what you should see happen here is we're going to um, utilize the Collective Brutality, and, oh, maybe it's still broke. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, another pause. All right, guys, we got it working again. Uh, so what we end up doing is uh, using the Dig Through Time to find Caracas and Collective Brutality, discard Swamp that we drew for the turn off Collective Brutality, um, take a Dismember out of hand, kill Lord of Atlantis, and flip the uh, the legendary Thada, um, and pass the turn back with Stifle up. Um, Rob Zadar plays Island for the turn and passes it. We do not uh, we do not kill one of the, or take one of the creatures at this point. Uh, because we want to leave Stifle up. Um, we probably should have once he played out the Thada, but I'm going to save the Stifle for something bigger. It looks like he's on a big mana situation, and it's not that relevant here. He plays out Thada, or Thada Adele, because, and frankly, I like the play because it forces me to tap down a land, the Caracas, namely. Caracas is really just a value land in this deck, though. It's just an effect. Um, it only produces colorless mana in the deck. So he passes it back after playing Thada again. We go ahead and drain this time because we're going to start taking life from him, because we're kind of in a board stall. We draw the best possible card in the deck, uh, which is Loam. Um, obviously not great right now, because we're only getting back one land with it, but we're going to start dredging with it and accruing pretty vast card advantage of exploration and play. Uh, we'll go ahead and flip uh, Thada. He replays Thada. Given this is not really limiting me on that much mana anymore, because I'm on an active Loam with exploration and play, which is a, it's a pretty big game. Um... We go ahead and drain him again. He passes it back. We end up loaming on our uh, on our draw step. And we find a Hindrelin Harbor and a Sunken Hollow. We get both back. He goes ahead and remands, which is a good play. Um, I just pass it back to him at this point. All right, so we see Thada come back down. We see a Shaper Apprentice, which is a new card from the new set, Ixalan, which it does have flying, and it's also a 2-1, which is not irrelevant. Um, we go ahead and drain him again. Our correction, gain the life. We gain the life here just to continue to reduce his lot or his, uh, his uh, graveyard size. So I actually think that's relevant nowadays. Like, you really probably need to look at graveyard size for, for Delve Mechanic. Um, we could have drained him for life there, but I'm not racing at this point. I'm just trying to build overwhelming advantage with Loam. Um, but it probably was right to actually just drain him, technically. Plays on Thada again. We're going to get hit for two, but two is not that relevant. Um, it's not, not enough damage to make us really worry, especially with an obstinate Bailoth in hand. We go ahead and take life this time. Uh, Loam again. Find Urborg. So we're not really getting a ton of advantage off uh, Loam right now. We just haven't hit that many lands. But we are getting up on land drops at least one to two every turn. Um, and um, 
we got to play our opposite in Bailoff out there. So we go. He was in taps us down. This make this play makes sense because he wants to replay the Thada so that his Shaper Apprentice gets flying, and he can activate his Blink Mars. Yeah, his Blink Moth Nexus and attack with both that and Shaper uh, Apprentice, which is a fine play. He's on obviously a, a very large mana situation. He's probably extremely flooded. Um, we're the we're the lone player with an active exploration. He's got. I think just as many, if not more, lands than we do in play. We find the Wasteland. Um, we uh, we could start going for the Wasteland lock here. Um, and we do use it to blow up his uh, utility lands. Uh, we go ahead and stifle this because we, we, I think, quite aptly put him on nothing in hand, like just a junky hand. Uh, he plays down the Thada again, you know, which is fine. Um, we go ahead, flip Thada, I believe. Or correction, reloam, flip Thada. We make a misplay here. We activate the Lumbering Falls. Uh, the new art on Rashad and Porter, that promo art, just kind of threw me off, I think. Um, we get tapped, which was an error. We should have just loamed the Wasteland, blown up the Rashad and Port. In response to him tapping it, activated the uh, Hexproof um, Lumbering Falls. That would have been the c correct play there. So we misplayed that. We attack in. We don't really care if this thing gets double blocked. It takes away two of his threats, strips him down, and leaves us with an available Death Rite Shaman, which is lethal on its own. Um, not his turn, but like his turn plus passing it next to my or to my next upkeep is going to be lethal. So that's the first game, a uh, 12 turn game against Merfolk. Um, a pretty commanding lead uh, from the Loam deck, I think. But he was also flooded, so I don't know if it was a great representation of a, of a solid game. So this hand has merits. Um, again, it has Dig Through Time. It has one Fetch Land. It has Crucible of Worlds, which is a powerful card, which means if Thada comes down, it's not going to get stolen. It also has Damnation. Finks plays well with Damnation because I can kind of, you know, force him, not force him, but like trick him into playing more creature cards out uh, because I have a threat in play. Um, we see Kosi's Trickster, which is actually a problem for this deck because we fetch a lot of lands. Um, and that means Kosi's Trickster is going to get very big. We see an Aether Vial, but no land drop, which means he kept a very greedy one and has kept it on the power of Aether Vial. We don't have a way to punish that right now, though. We draw Caracas, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a fine card. If he has a Legendary Merfolk, we can go ahead and flip it. Unless it's that new one that, like, makes everything cost two more. So he found a land for this draw step. Um, he goes ahead and attack. And we have no have not fetched here because we don't really care to... Uh, to get attacked for three as opposed to one. Um, we go ahead and do it on the end step, though. Getting a breeding pool and um, the, uh, not the undergrads, the watery grave. Um, pumping it to a 3-3. Three, three, and we go ahead and draw Abrupt Decay. And we're like, oh, wow, that's a pretty good draw. Um, so we know he's in a light mana situation. He obviously kept a more greedy hand. Um, and we blow up the Aether Vial in response to trigger during his upkeep. He brainstorms, does not find a land, which is is good news for us. Um, so what we do here is we uh, we play our land. Uh, go ahead and play out the Kitchen Finks because I don't, you know, I could play the Coiling Oracle out. A lot of these cards play fine into Wrath effects. Like Coiling Oracle is just fine to play into a Wrath effect. I mean, it's a one one, but it cycles. So I mean, you're just you're kind of forcing them to overcommit with it. Um, but he plays the Master, and the Master is a problem. Uh, we draw very well for the turn here. Um, in the form of uh, Collective Brutality. So we go ahead and Brutality it, but it gets misdirected onto the Coiling Oracle, which again is, is kind of fine. I mean, it's not going to end the game for us. Uh, but we know we're going to get hit for four again. And guys, it looks like maybe we hit another, uh, another stop in the game. Let me uh, see if we can progress it by a turn step. Nope, unfortunately it is frozen again, so we'll be right back. All right, sorry guys, we got it working again. So he continued to dead draw after brainstorming into nothing. Um, we were able to resolve a crucible on the following turn um, and initiate recursion of our fetch lands such that we were able to fix for black mana. The problem I'm running into now is that I know he has no lands in hand, so he's got six cards that are probably all gas, and probably a lot of them are counter magic. So I want to get to a point where I can leave up counter squall, but I'm taking a sizable beating to do it. So at this point we draw the Maelstrom Pulse, which is actually a great draw for the turn. So we go to one life, play out the um, the Tropical Island, um, and this allows us to leave up the Counter Squall to protect this spell over using Damnation. So he does have Counter Spell, as kind of expected. We go ahead and Counter Squall it. We kill this thing, and then go ahead and pass it back. Um, 
I don't remember or not if he attacks with his uh, Trickster. So he plays out the Inkwell Infiltrator, which is a 2-1 that cannot be blocked. He does not attack here. Um, obviously, right now, we, we do not have the ability to fetch, but now we do. So we actually don't do it this turn. We don't fetch this turn. We want to stay at 3 life, and we play out the True Name Nemesis. He plays out the Shaper Apprentice, which is a card that is going to be a sizable beating because if he plays any Merfolk out, he can jump over for uh, for two damage. We find Jace and Obstin the Bailoth, play Jace out, bounce, and then set up to draw a ton of cards next turn. At this point in time, he goes ahead and concedes uh, because we've established a pretty, it's a soft lock, but a pretty good lock on the game. But with him on three lands, low resources, uh, but a larger hand size, our hand size is going to continue to increase. And not to mention, we have a pretty busted hand. So, I mean, we can gain life back. We have Treasure Cruise to, to delve into glory. And um, at this point, he just says, hey, I'm, I'm good to go. Like, I don't I don't need to see any more for now. Um, so we played a second set of games against Rob with him on White Weenie. Um, and he obliged because I kind of wanted to test this deck more against aggro. So I don't think it's a horrendous matchup, but I don't think it's also great either for, like, really fast aggro. So he plays Planes out turn one. No play, though, which means he probably has something good. Like, probably has a good two drop in there. We play the Death Ride out just in case he goes for a fetch land. At this point, he plays down Spectral Rider, which is a card that I'm not, like, horrendously afraid of because I have the Mystical Tutor. It's going to be able to make me, uh, or get me a Wrath if I need one. I do go ahead and play the Coiling Oracle out here because I want to draw into more lands and put them into play. I do not, though, because um, my last land is this is island in my hand, and I, I would prefer to have another Black Source. Plays out Knight of the Nimbus. We get hit for two. He passes it back. We draw a true name for the turn. Um, we go ahead, and I believe here we pass it with the intent to leave up Counterspell and Mystical Tutor for a Wrath effect. Um, he goes ahead and jams with both. We just take here. I want him to continue to play into this. Now, when he plays Finks, I actually do counter it because I don't want to have a threat on the board after I'm done Wrathing the board. So, a Mystical Tutor, typically speaking, I would get Intuition or, or Loam, but because he's established a, a great deal of board dominance... Um, I just want to take care of the board now. So I go ahead and wipe the board down to 12. Um, if he Armageddon's me here, the game's over. Uh, but he's down to two cards. I believe he plays a threat out here. Yeah, Porcelain Legion Error. But we have True Name Nemesis, which is a solid follow-up. Now we're kind of just looking for a fetch land or something like that to allow Lotus Cobra to get us into Corsair, Finks, etc. He plays on a Ranger of Ass, um, which gets him, I believe, a Figure of Destiny and a Stud of War. The two, the two common picks. Sometimes I see um, uh, Ballista, Walking Ballista, and Hangerback Walker. So we draw our fetch land there, um, play out the Cobra, put the fetch in play, make green, fetch, get another green source, or I believe, yeah, green-blue source, put it into play tap, though, and then play out the Finx to go back up on life a little bit and just buy ourselves time. So what we're looking to do right now is establish enough mana in our mana base that we can play out the Eternal Witness and um, execute another uh, Toxic Deluge, and then follow up with probably Corsair. Um, so we're just playing it very safe right now, and he is just going ham, just throwing them all at us. Um, we get pretty lucky here and draw Intuition, which is um, and, and have a fetch on top after playing the Corsair, which is going to allow us to get our engine online. Um, not to mention just make tons of mana. So we end up playing Intuition, finding the Life from the Loam, um, the in the in the combo, which is Dark Depths and uh, and Thespian Stage. So we go ahead and search it out, and final he gives us the Loam, and goes ahead and concedes it there. When he sees Damnation on top, he he knows the game's over, regardless of having Damnation on top or not. Um, we, we have the Toxic Deluge and the uh, Eternal Witness, which can just wipe the board, and then we can go into Loam with him on zero cards and establish a Dark Depths Thespian Stage combo, which even if he was able to Path to Exile or Sword of the Plowshares, would be able to continue to recurse um, turn after turn. So that's kind of how the deck works. Um, it is at its heart a control deck. Um, and, you know, when it, when it gets to go to the long game, it tends to do well. So the game two, we actually lose in, and it was actually an interesting match because it was very close. Um, so this is our opening hand, which you don't think you could lose against White Weenie with a hand like this, but check out what happens. So we don't really have a lot of early, early interaction. We have a glut of three drops. 
We our mana is good, so we'll be able to cast stuff. We draw another three drop, which is not really what we want to draw. Sort of light and shadow is a very good one, but it's kind of slow. Um, he plays on a Thalia turn two, which is is a strong card against you know a deck that plays a preponderance of spells. I think we have like twenty three to twenty five critters in it. We play on Scavenging Huge Vows, I think is a strong draw, and I expect that at some point it's going to be able to do some solid work. So when he plays this, I know I'm in trouble, because that means that the turn that I use my Virtue's Ruin, um, when I say this, I mean Selfless Spirit, I'm only going to kill the Selfless Spirit. So Virtue's Ruin essentially says, pay for mana, kill Selfless Spirit, is what the card says right now. Um, we go ahead and play out Leavold, uh, because it's all we really can do this turn. And we attack. If he wants to trade, like I am willing to trade the Scavenging Ooze here. He does not, though, which is wise, because if he does, like, I have a Wrath, so... Really, at this point, though, if, if Virtue's Ruin had been Toxic Deluge, it would have been a lot better. We get hit for two. We still have time, though. I believe uh, we end up drawing another land here. Oh, Stifle. Okay, so we draw Stifle, which Stifle is actually nice, because Stifle allows us to stop the Selfless Spirit once we get to mana. We're not quite there yet. What happens here is atrocious, though. So he plays out the Sublime Archangel, which is not a card I'm a huge fan of, but it does a lot of damage real fast. Kind of like a burn card, almost. It's like a Lava Axe on legs. Um, so we get it for seven. Half our life is basically gone, or close to half our life is gone. We go ahead and play out the Fetch, Fetch, and Concede, because at this point, the line of play that we had wanted to do, which was uh, to cast Virtue's Room for four uh, and back it up with Stifle, cannot be done because of Thalia. So Thalia is going to make Stifle cost two and Virtue's Room cost uh, four. We only have five mana available, uh, which means we lose the game. We could have attacked with sort of Light and Shadow um, and, and gained three life. But because he has Sublime Archangel in play, um, it's just gonna it's gonna be faster than than what we can do. Um, another thing we could have explored is the possibility of um, <clears throat> no, I guess we couldn't do that. We couldn't attach. Well, here's something we maybe so let's let's think this through. So if we Virtue's Ruin, he blows up Selfless Spirit. The Angel still attacks for eight. We can gain one off Scavenging Ooze. Not good enough. We could attack with the sword. Gain three up to ten. Angel swings for... I'm making a pretty safe assumption here. But I think... Yeah, I don't think we could have won this. Because if he plays any creature, the Angel still swings for lethal. Because right now it gives itself exalted. So it's one, two, three, four, five. It's a nine power attacker. If he plays any creature, it kills me. Even if I swing with the sword and gain the life. So that was the second game. Uh, quite the beating. Which is one of the things that decks like this, this, this deck specifically, or just decks like this will tend to struggle with, is like very fast aggro draws. You can just, just smoke it. Um, so we go for a preordain here. See Dread of Night and Life from the Loam. We could not ask for more. Um, those are probably the two cards we want to see the most. He does nothing, which leads me to believe he probably has a strong turn, turn to play like a Thalia or something like that, or like uh, maybe a Rip, a Rest in Peace. We go ahead and just Loam for nothing, um, because Loam's that good that I prefer to spend my mana doing nothing this turn, just to get it my graveyard. I find a land with Loam. I go ahead and play out the Dread of Night. We were correct on our assessment that he had a strong 2-drop to have kept without a 1-drop. We go ahead and play, uh, play out the Sunken Hollow, draw back the uh, Breeding Pool, and leave down the uh, the managed rain here. Um, so we get ripped, which is it's not that big that big of a deal. We still have drain up here. We get to drain this, which is would have been a lot better than draining a rip, I think, uh, because it takes away three cards from. Um, we get a ton of mana off drain. Now we we have some embarrassing plays here. We have a Titania and an Eternal Witness with a rip in play, which is pretty bad. We just ditch the um the death mark because death mark's a fine card but you know I, I think right now we just want to continue to eat his hand apart which we continue to do um we bang in there for seven he plays down an elizabeth kills our liliana which he's probably obliged to do i figured when i saw him ditch this mirror and crusader that he had something really stellar in hand uh, because mirror and crusader tends to be good against this deck we draw Ponder for our turn, which is a hot rip. Um, we end up uh, pondering into sort of light, Fire and Ice, plus two lands. One of them being this land right here, which allows us to put the other land on the bottom. Um, and at this point, I don't think we can really lose very easily. Um, I forget what we draw for the turn. Crop Rotation, not really relevant. The game's kind of over at this point. 
uh, because we were able to establish early loam lock, and we have a Dread of Night that just mitigates like 90% of his threats. Not 90%, but like it, it does kill a lot of his threats. We go ahead and play a course round, show an obstinate Baloth on top. We could have crop rotation there just to, you know, show our abundance of, of, of wealth. Um, but obstinate Baloth is frankly fine. If he has a way to answer the board, then obstinate Baloth is a fine play. It'll gain us more life, and we have a 4 4 attacker. Um, so that was, uh, that was the series of games, um, against, uh, more aggressive style decks. One really, uh, an aggro control deck, and this is just a pure aggressive deck. Um, but this is, this is, uh, this is Soltai Loam, Soltai Loam Control. A uh, very powerful deck. Um, it has a very crushing mid and late game. Its late game is, is just probably 100% inevitability against any deck that plays mostly non-basic lands, because it can, uh, it can uh, it can loam lock you with uh, wasteland plus continue to recurse twenty twenties, um, which is pretty good. Um, so the deck itself um, runs a smaller a smaller counter magic package. Um, it is more it more so plays out like a rock based control deck. Um, so you have a lot of sweeper options in it uh, to include um, include pernicious deed um, to include damnation to include toxic deluge. Another interesting card that it's playing is um, is actually Hero's Downfall, because I think it will tend to have problems in the very early game with Planeswalkers. Um, once it gets to the mid-game, Planeswalkers are a lot of value, but Loam, I think, outvalues Planeswalkers pretty rapidly. Um, if you're able to get, you know, to the combo, um, it's pretty tough to deal with, a, you know, a 20-20. Um, getting rid of that, you know, even when you do, like, getting rid of it, like, and you can recurse it every time, it's just, it's it's probably a good game. So, very cool deck. Um I'm not sure sure how fair it is. I think I think with the meta, if we were to play this deck in the meta that we had, you know, before the changes in the ban list, this would be a, a, an extremely unfair deck. But I think given you know the the unbannings, um, there's there's a little more power in the format, um, and I think it will it will generate um, a shift in how folks sideboard their decks. Um, I think rest in peace is a very necessary card. I was actually talking to Rob while we were playing these games. And for White Weenie specifically, I think, you know, Stone Cloaker becomes a better option. Um, it's a fine card anyway. Some folks don't like it. I don't think Rob says he likes it. Jotun Grunts is a fine card against the graveyard-based decks. Um, another one that I think is actually extremely good is um, is Samurai the Pale Curd. I think it's very underrated. I don't see it all that often. Um, the only downside to that card is, is it kind of beats you up if you're playing Hollowed Spirit Keeper, which I think is a good card to play in that deck because it plays well around Wrath effects. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I think this deck in general is 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 a natural strategy that exists now in the format um, with these these series of unbannings, just loam control. Um, I don't know if it's best. I think it's very strong, um, and I think you know we'll end up seeing is is we'll have to we'll have to stop skimping on the graveyard hate that we have in our sideboards to beat to beat cards like Life in the Loam with the Intuition package and with the the mystical uh, the mystical tutor package. Uh, because once Loam gets going, um, you know it's it's tough to stop. It's very very t difficult to stop because it's just it's a, it's essentially ancestral recall every couple of turns. You know, um, not got it. It's for lands, but I mean the virtual advantage it provides and you know the synergies it can provide with a graveyard based deck like this. You know, you see like Titania, Eternal Witness, uh, Scavenging Ooze before um, the other sword, the Sword of uh, Light and Shadow. Um, you can just you can get just so much card advantage off of it. So. That's the deck. I hope you guys enjoyed this short video series on um, my testing under the new ban list. And, um, you know, if you're interested in, in how to play Loam or how to break it, I, I suppose this, this video should show you uh, one way to do it. Um, there are certainly many others, um, but I think this is a very strong strong archetype right here that, uh, that we're kind of just unveiling because of the availability of a couple cards um, in the format. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, take care now.